all these people saw these two lights, and they were like making it out to be like it was aliens or something on the news. That's why I this was here things. or in Tampa? Here. Here. Oh, I didn't see that. Um, so we're continuing now with uh, examples of uh, fractals from biological systems. I was going to say aliens, but I. Um, and um, getting more and more colored spots from the pens on my. But um, so let, let's continue. Um, this is another example. This is a very famous example. Let me set this up a little bit. Um, uh, what? The Wilson yeah, what's the spelling mistake? Is another spelling mistake? Yeah, oh, composer, composer, right. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, there's, uh, in, um, in this language, uh, which was popular amongst artificial intelligence people for a while, although they shifted to C called Lisp, and so there were many functions in Lisp that were said with a Lisp. Oh. Uh, yeah, because this was like, um, from like MIT sort of people and stuff. And there's even uh, a version of Lisp, a very popular compiler, which is called Franz Lisp, uh, which is a Lisp on Lisp. But, but that was the name of this compiler, Franz Lisp. OK, so um, there was a longstanding debate which intensified roughly between 1900 and the early 1940s about how evolution worked. And there were, there were two different thoughts on this. One was that mutations happen in response to environmental change. Um, so, for example, and then they get adapted, or they're, then they're part of the genome. So, for example, um, you have a, um, I forget which animal it was. It was uh, like a, um, it was a small lizard. Um, could have been a frog. Was it the midwife toad? There were experiments by, by a guy named Lamarck. And, um, it was either a toad or, 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 a, um, or a reptile. And it, under certain circumstances, he thought they were developing little suction cups on their feet to help them climb up a wall. So the idea here is, and then that was incorporated in the genome, and so they had them afterwards. And the argument here is that they needed to do something. So in response to a change in the environment, you get a mutation. And the opposite idea was that mutations happen all the time. But only some are selected for when the environment favors them, when they're useful in the environment. because the environment has changed. So, so there were these two different approaches to evolution. There were these two different approaches to evolution. Again, that the mutations happen in response to the environmental change or that they happen all the time and then are just selected for. And there were a number of experiments that were tried to differentiate these two possibilities, and the experiments for 50 years were not conclusive. Um, then in the 1940s, um, a collaboration of a very famous physicist and a very famous biologist, which were uh, Salvador Luria and Max Delbruck. There may be an umlaut here somewhere. Um, worked on this problem. Uh, Delbruck was one of a group of physicists who thought there was nothing interesting to do in physics because people had worked out quantum mechanics 
And so Delbruck decided to figure out how life worked, applied physical studies to life, and basically invented quantitative aspects of biochemistry. And uh, Luria went on to do many other things involving evolution and um, uh, genetics and um, biology things. Um, and their approach to this problem was the following. Their approach was to look at the I tended to say probability density functions, and I will say that, but, but let me say it in a different way first. Their, their, their idea was the following. If we run an experiment and we start with cells in a dish, and then we do, this is sideways looking at the cells, if we, we challenge them with an environment, if the, the cells only mutate um, it works for me, but not for you. If the cells only mutate when the environment changes, uh, then we can calculate what the probability distribution, or let me, again, I'm trying not to say that, what the mean number of mutations would be, and also the probability density function. The reason why I'm trying not to say probability density function is because they were unable in this article to calculate the PDF, and that was done a few years later by Lee and Colson. So they were able to get certain characteristics of the PDF, such as its variance, but they were actually not able to derive the PDF from the situation. Well, what are the statistics of this? If we have a certain number of cells and we have a low probability of getting a mutation, the number of mutant colonies at the end of the experiment will be a Gaussian distribution. In the limit at which the probability of mutations is small, this becomes a Poisson distribution. And it doesn't have a big variance. Remember we said the variance of a Poisson distribution goes like the square root of the mean, actually. So it's a reasonable size variance. So this is if the mutations happen in response. But if, if mutations happen all the time, the situation is somewhat more complicated. Because there are two factors that come into play. So if we have one cell, and then it produces two cells, and those two cells produce four cells, et cetera, so now we have to look in time what happens, because the mutations are happening all the time. If a mutation happens early on here, then it will produce a lot of mutant daughter cells. So when the environment changes, there'll be a large number of mutant cells. So if the mutation happens late in this cycle, like over here, just at the same time the environment changes, there'll be a small number of mutant cells. So if the mutation happens very early and we have a, large, lot, a large generation, uh, many generation times, we'll get a large number of mutant cells. If it happens late, we'll get a small number. So we're amplifying the number of mutant cells by how many generations we have. And so we have a big variance at the end in the number of mutant cells in this distribution. Do you want me to say that again, or is that clear? OK. So uh, because, we, as I said, the crucial point is we have this amplification because the mutations are happening all along, and they get amplified by the number of generations. As I said, they were unable to derive this distribution. That is, given you run this experiment many times, how often should you get how many mutations? So the PDF, they were unable to derive. But they were able to show that the variance, if the variance is, was small, it would mean the distribution was Poisson, and it would mean rotations happen in response to the environment. If the variance was large, it would mean it wasn't Poisson, and that variations happen all the time. Mutations happen all the time, and are then selected for. In a way, this is a very interesting experiment because this was a long-standing problem in biology, and it was resolved by a quantitative measure, um, sort of more like a physics experiment would be done. So it's very interesting that this biological question was not answered really by a logical approach, but by really a physics more approach, which is very interesting. And um, this uh, article that I'll now describe the work from is actually a very famous article. And in fact, um, in uh, the uh, version of the Journal of 
journal called Genetics that I looked this up in, if you looked at this copy of the journal, if this is a copy of the journal, um, there was a black line running through the edge of the, of the volume of this journal, which was this article. So many people had looked at this article. This article is considerably dirtier than the other articles in this issue. This is a very famous, uh, famous article. And let's go through it. So um, it was by Luria and Dalbrook. Um, the, um, this was repeated in 1988 in a different way in 1989. Um, and it doesn't say here, but we'll come to the reference for Lee and Coulson, who derived the PDF. So as I said, we let the colony grow and we challenge it with a virus, which is the change in the environment. And then we determine the mutant cells at the end of each experiment. And this just repeats what I said uh, before, that if things happen, there are mutations all the time and then selection. If we have sometimes a mutation early on, it will produce as many doublings as there are generations. If the mutations are only directed by the change in the environment, we only have the mutations when the environment changes, which here is toward the end. So in this case, we only produce two mutant cells, in this case one. In this case, we produce no mutant cells. In this case, there were two mutant cells. And in this case, since we have a mutation very early, it produces a huge number of mutant cells. In this case, we only have one. So you can see, again, from the three cases, that the variation um, in the mutations happening all the time that are then selected for, as opposed to mutations happening directed by the environment, that this has a much larger variance. And in fact, as I said, the actual PDF was derived a few years later by Lee and, uh, Lee and Coulson. So the idea is that if there's a big variation, then uh, we have mutations all the time, and little variation, um, then we have them um, only in response to the environment. And what uh, Lurie and Delbrook found is that the variations were large. And they were much larger than could be explained by a Poisson distribution. And so therefore, they concluded that the e mutations happen all the time. And this was an, a really crucial turning point in biology because everybody believed this. Okay. Uh, another way that Luria went on to show afterwards, just to sort of complete part of this story, is one of the possibilities would be to show that if you had mutant colonies, that colonies in the dish, you know, if these form the mutations, if mutations were happening all the time, the next set of mutations would be formed by a different colony. So it was useful to show that different colonies all the time were forming mutations. And Luria did this by a technique uh, which is called replica, a uh, replica grading, a replica, there's another word here, but it was a replica technique. And what he did was he took uh, felt, today he probably would have taken Velcro, um, but what he did was he could take a dish of cells, place the felt on it, the felt would pick up cells, but not all the cells from this dish, and he could then push the felt down on a number of other dishes and basically create the same set of colonies in the same location in each dish. And he showed them when you ran the experiments on these dishes, sometimes the mutants at the end that were found at the end started here, sometimes there, and sometimes elsewhere. So that different parts, different cells in the dish were always mutating. Okay. And um, this replica technique also gave further credence to this result, although people believed the result as I understand it. Um, just from this article alone. So this is a crucial turning point in biology, resolving an issue that's been hotly debated for nearly 50 years and showed that mutations happen all the time and they're selected for. So what is this probability density function? You know, it's really interesting to me, uh, Delbrook, who probably won at least one Nobel Prize um, and was a very, uh, um, uh, very important physicist. Uh, I know his last PhD student who w was the last person that Delbrook trained before he died, who's in Syracuse now. Um, Delbrook was unable to derive this probability density function, okay, which is interesting because Delbrook is no dummy, okay, but this distribution was just difficult for them to handle. And this article is really interesting because you can see they're trying to derive aspects of this distribution and they can't quite do it. 
They know it's got a big variance, but they can't handle it. He just doesn't have the perspective to see what this distribution is. And the reason why is the distribution is fractal. So let's look at the, and it shows you how hard it is to deal with fractals if you're not familiar with them. And let's see why it's fractal. Let's say the probability of a mutation of a cell is 1 out of 16. So 1 out of 16 times we'll get a mutation in each generation. So for each generation, we need to multiply the probability per cell times the number of cells in that generation will give us the probability that in that generation we get a mutation. And then uh, each generation, we multiply the probability of that mutation times the number of offsprings it produces at the end, which will be the number of generations or uh, an exp exp two raised to the number of generations. And that will give us the number of mutants that we have uh, at the end in the experiment. And from that, we can calculate the uh, distribution. You can see also uh, that Mandelbrot, this is actually 1974, uh, was also involved in calculating this distribution. Isn't that older than we all thought? Isn't that what? It was 1074, then you'd be older than anyone ever thought. Then older than? You'd be older than anyone ever thought. Right, 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 right. Well, only if he was at least 30 in, uh, uh, when the bat, or whatever it was. Um, oops. All right, so let's look at, look at this again. Uh, this is uh, an attempt to represent the doubling of the generations. If this is the mutation rate per cell, so that's constant in the generation. As we go to long, more and more generations, there are twice as many cells in each generation. So here, if there are two ce one cell, there'll be two here, four here, eight here, et cetera. So we multiply these two together, we get the probability of the mutation per generation. But uh, this generation produces twice as many cells at the end as that one. So we multiply these together. And so we actually get that the probability or the expected number per each generation is actually in the final end, each generation contributes on average one cell to the end. And this is basically the St. Petersburg game. So we basically have an infinite number. The mean number of mutations is infinite. And that's why Dalbrook couldn't calculate it because he had a fractal probability density function that would produce a mean of infinity. And it's exactly the same thing as in the St. Petersburg game. Now, uh, because of this, um, people did not know how to handle these experiment results. As I said, they knew that this has a large variance. In fact, the variance is infinite here. Uh, it will increase with the number of generations. And this has led to a practical problem, which is one of the mathematical issues which is not yet resolved in this field. Um, about 10 years ago now, uh, Karens, who's a British um, biologist, and his probably most notable discovery was something called omega figures in the replication of uh, DNA. Um, in, when DNA is in a ring in a virus, when it starts to be duplicated, uh, it will the new part will break off from the old part where it's been replicated and stick to the old part. So you get figures that look something like this, like the letter omega. Uh, uh, and, and what? Yeah, you, you just said each, the cumulative probability of there being a mutation isn't, is it going to go up like that? Because each generation, I know there's going to be more cells. Right, let, let, let me say it, in a, I'll say it in a different way. The, prob the, the probability in each, in each generation K will depend on the number of cells that are there in that generation, which is of the order of two, um, 2 to the K. But the number of daughters produced by this will be proportional to the number of generations that are going to double later. Now, this is bad notation. Let me try to say it in words, and then try to make up the notation. In each generation, as we go down here, the probability of a mutation goes up by a 2 for each generation. But the number of mutant cells at the end that it produced, the number of daughter cells that it produces, goes down by a half because there's one less generation. So the probability of a mutation goes up by a factor of 2. 
but the number of daughters goes down by a half. So we're always dealing in a situation that looks like this to get the total mean number. Okay, so this is, is exactly like the um, St. Petersburg game because the, uh, the winnings goes up by a factor of two if the head happens one further out, but the probability of getting that goes down by a two. So here the probability is in the, th these have sort of changed roles, but we're always getting a situation like this. D does that answer it, or you want me to try to do it with the notation so it looks right? What? I uh, will try. And then I'll give another example where this is relevant. Um, let's call this the nth generation. And let's look back here at generation um, n minus k. So we look k back. The number of cells in generation n minus k is going to be 2 to the n minus k. Okay? So the pro well, there'll be some probability, which I'll call p naught, pro which is the probability per cell of getting a mutation. So the, num the probability of getting a mutation in this generation is 2 to the n minus k times p naught. Now, how many doublings will there be between this and n? The number of doublings, the number of cells that are produced, will be 2 raised to the difference between here and there, which will be n minus n minus k. So the number of doublings of cells that are produced will be 2 um, to the k. So for each generation, the number contributed to the n will be 2 to the n minus k times 2 to the k, or 2 to the n. So the point is that each generation produces the same, same contribution toward the total mutations at the end. And as the limit as n goes to infinity, then the total number here goes to infinity. So the easiest way to see this, if I take this 2 to the n factor corresponds to the amount of dollars 1. If I take out that 2 to the n, we're basically getting 2 to the minus k times 2 to the plus k. So this was the, in terms of the St. Petersburg, this was the probability at each level, and this was the winnings. And so this is going to be summed um, over all generations, which in this case is n. So I basically get 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 up to n. So this is like playing at n times. And as n keeps increasing, this keeps increasing. There's a certain aspect of the, of the genetic uh, thing of this, which I don't understand, actually. Luckily, we haven't hit it here. Um, but I have to sit down sometime with a molecular bi biologist I know named David Axelrad at Rutgers, who has asked me over email a number of questions about this, one question, actually. And, and um, that I'm not sure of the answer of. So there are some aspects of this which I'm actually a little confused about, um, although we haven't come to that really here. But, but we're basically in the same situation where the number of mutations is not going to level off. It's going to depend on the number of generations. Whereas in the Poisson distribution, it doesn't depend on the number of generations. Okay. Uh, the other example where this happens is in a tumor. Because we have the same situation in a growing tumor. Uh, and usually the mutations may involve uh, resistance to chemotherapy, uh, chemotherapeutic uh, agents. And we have the same situation, whereas we get to later and later generations, we have more and more um, resistant cells. Now, what this means in terms of a tumor is that the number of chemically resistant cells 
arises an equal number arises from each generation in the tumor. Okay? Because that's what the St. Petersburg paradox means. Now it actually turns out in real tumors that the number of resistant cells grows faster than this. Okay? And what that means, and people know this from other evidence, what actually happens when a tumor grows is actually lots of cells in the tumor die. And the growth rate of the tumor is actually a balance of cells multiplying and cells dividing. So that means that the phenotype, actually the genotype of the tumor, is more dependent on the cells that happened in the later mutations than earlier. Okay. In fact, the, the, uh, a very large fraction of the cells die in the tumor. I, I can't say a number like 90%, but it's actually very large. So what this means is that the tumor grows. Much more of the tumor is chemo-resistant than you would expect. Okay, so this is actually a serious problem in, in killing tumors. And it also means if there's a, a delicate balance between um, um, growth, a delicate balance between a multiplication rate and death rate that determines the growth of the tumor, then any agent that changes that a little bit will have a tremendous effect on the growth rate of the tumor. And, and so this is of importance in trying to understand what to do uh, or to suggest things that might help uh, in terms of preventing or slowing the tumor growth. Uh, another way this comes up, the fractals come up, is in power spectra. So instead of switching back here, if we look at power spectra, and I'll say this in terms of uh, wavelets also, we can look at small scale features by looking at components of the power spectra wavelets that are small. And we can look at big scale features by looking at long frequency, long wavelength. So this is small wavelength, large wavelength. And so how the power spectra depends, power is a function of frequency, on frequency is in essence a fractal measure. And very often we see if we plot log of the power at a given frequency versus log of the frequency, we see a situation that looks like a straight line, again, a characteristic power law scaling, where the power depends on 1 over the frequency to some power. And this is always called 1 over f, even when the exponent here is not 1. And this is, is, is called this because in many cases, you would think that if you look at variations in an experiment, um, you would think that the power spectrum of uncorrelated things is what's called white noise, that it doesn't depend on frequency. But in fact, it's been found that most noise in nature is more like 1 over f noise and not uh, white noise. This is called white noise because it has power at all frequencies in the same way that white light has consists of the sum of frequencies. So this example of 1 over f noise is therefore really something with fractal characteristics. And um, this just shows that. Uh, and it also represents a variance um, going to a, vari a situation where the variance goes to infinity. And we have fluctuations at all scales. And so the, the power at a given scale, I won't say it again, but of course that screen had Cotman's, uh, the name of Cotman's father on it. But, um, so now I have to uh, uh, reload this. Thank you. Um, as I probably said once before, I can do two things at one time, but not three things. So I can talk and type, but I can't look at the screen at the same time. So either I've got to stop talking, or I'll type in the wrong things, or I won't look at the screen and type in the right thing. 
So, um... It's, it's actually doing what it's supposed to be doing. Somewhere in the universe, there's probably a person who uh, has made their keyword the symbol that corresponds to those little circles. So instead of typing in letters, they actually type in those little circles. It's all right. It's, it's, uh, <laughs> come on. I should probably just hide behind the sheet that says technical difficulties. Please stand by. What? I said, please stand by. Right. If you play a little elevator music, please stand by. And that's all done afterwards with the dubbing and stuff. Uh, <laughs> I've been period. These guys are good back here. They could probably do it real time. Yeah. This, this radio station I listen to, Buzz, uh, has uh, this, this contest called Elevator from Hell. And I finally understood what the, where the name comes from. Because what they have is they have like versions of alternative rock songs played as if they were like the thousand and one strings, which are like elevator music. And then you have to identify what the song is. Um, so, and it's called Elevator from Hell. It says, reading presentation, please, please wait. Like it says, please. <laughs> like you have much of a choice, you know. So that's, uh, Bill Gates just playing with you. I think it's please uh, wait rather than please throw me through the window. Yeah. Right. Please don't hurt me. <laughs> I had this vision once of a, uh, I had a, uh, someone I worked for who was always very cheap in buying things and he always tried to save money by buying stuff that never quite worked, which was not, <laughs> in the long run, just counterproductive. And um, I had a vision of him buying, because it was less expensive, a user hostile word processor. <laughs> so, you know, like you would do things that would like say really hostile things when you misspelled things. <laughs> <laughs> no one would want such a thing, so he would be, he would be <laughs> able to buy it more cheaply. I, I enjoy something like that. <laughs> okay. Okay, so here, here we are. Uh, the variance, and this is, these are examples of this. This is uh, an example in time. So this is a plot of log of power spectrum amplitude. This one? Yeah, th this says that the uh, power spectrum has a one over F form, and if we integrate this, uh, we'll find the variance goes to infinity, depending on the value of alpha. Uh, the power itself will either go to, to, to infinity at uh, small frequencies or large frequencies depending on the value of alpha. Uh, and maybe I can say that here. So uh, if we integrate total power, it will be uh, an integral over all frequencies. And if this f to the minus alpha, depending on the value of alpha, this will go to infinity at either zero or infinity, depending on the value of alpha. So we get uh, one minus alpha, and 
if alpha is greater than 1, then, uh, when, then at infinity, at the frequency goes to infinity, the total power will go to infinity. If alpha is less, is less than 1, then when uh, we get to 0, we'll have um, 1 over 0, which will be infinite, so the power will uh, go to infinity. And when we have alpha equals 1, then we have the log of f between 0 and infinity, and both at 0 and infinity, the power will go to infinity. So you can kind of think as the total power as being related to the mean or the moment of this thing. Um, and so depending on the value of alpha at one limit or the other, uh, we'll, we'll have a situation that is not normalizable and where the probability density function doesn't exist uh, as we have in these Levey stable or fractal uh, distributions. Um, Supposedly, uh, Markov, from Markov processes, when he did derivations, was very rigorous, but didn't always write down the steps in consecutive order, which is a little bit the way this is beginning to appear. Um, but, um, and this shows, uh, whoa, this shows uh, some uh, example, because I hit another button at the same time. Uh, this shows some examples of that. In time, this is the uh, log of the amplitude of the power spectra um, versus frequency. And this is a 1 over f pa power spectra for the QRS complex recorded in a heartbeat. So uh, this is electrical activity in the heart. This shows uh, in, in a power spectrum not in time but in space. And this is um, a radioactive isotope. Uh, deposited in the liver and then placed against the photographic film and so they could measure the splotchiness of the radioactivity and where it's deposited in the liver. And again, the power spectra here has a power law form, um, which is characteristic of this sort of fractal. And um, so, so what's the take-home lesson of all this? Well, the take-home lesson here is that when the moments such as the mean or variance don't exist, what should you measure? And the answer is, you should measure how some property depends on the resolution used to measure it. And typically what you want to do is plot a log of that against the log of the scale and measure the slope. And then that slope will be related to the fractal dimension. So this is the, the essential lesson of uh, today. So I'll leave this on until I see the pen stop moving. Okay, um, and as examples of different measurements that we can use for what to measure, one example we've seen is the use of the mean. For example, in the average density within a circle as a radius as a function, sorry, as a radius of a function of that uh, circle. Um, and um, we've seen that in terms of the diffusion limited aggregation. Another measure we might use is this relative dispersion, which is the standard deviation divided by the mean. And we saw this in terms of use of the uh, heart data with uh, Bassingthwaite, which is slightly misspelled here. Um, and um, in terms of, of measuring how the relative dispersion depended on the sizes of the pieces of the heart. Uh, the Fano factor, uh, which is the variance divided by the mean, which uh, Teich used to analyze the um, um, interspike intervals. Uh, Teich, as you heard when he was here, is now into another factor called the Allen factor, which I don't have here because this is frozen in time and doesn't get updated. Uh, 
And another example might be the mean squared deviation, um, which is related to that RMS value that we saw in terms of rocks, but has also been used in terms of analysis of sequence data from uh, DNA. Um, and the Hertz rescaled range, this R over S, which Hertz used to measure the uh, variation in rainfall in the Nile to decide how large a um, uh, uh, reservoir was needed. Uh, and as we have used in order to look at the memory in terms of drawing in breaths into the lung. Um, and examples where these statistical properties or fractals have been measured, as we've seen, include action potentials in nerve cells, blood flow in the heart, the volumes of breaths, mutations, as I explained. We saw the power spectrum of the electrical activity of the heartbeat. Um, We've seen the distribution of tracer in the liver, and I've also used this to measure the voltages across T lymphocytes, and in, it's also been used in sequence data of, of DNA, and there are probably even more examples here. So th th uh, there aren't. Um, again, the conclusion here is that what they, which means everybody else but me, taught you in school is basically Gaussian statistics. But what we have in fractals and in real life or distributions that are broader than that, which are called stable or Levy stable distributions. And these Gaussian distributions are a subset of these more general stable distributions, but these stable distributions have properties beyond simple Gaussian uh, distributions. And uh, some of the differences are that the Gaussian distributions have moments that are not equal to zero and are finite and have a variance that's finite whereas the fractal distributions have moments that can be zero or infinity. I have to picture a little infinity sticking off of here. And have the property that the variance is really infinite, where approaches larger and larger values as we look at more and more data. And for these Gaussian distributions, there are lots of statistical tests, which we've covered in this class, to tell if parameters are different at different times or different between different experimental conditions. And we actually discuss uh, the student's t-test and uh, f-test, respectively, from uh, Gossett and Fisher, and analysis of variance, and even non-parametric tests that did not assume things were Gaussian. But the fractal distributions are much broader than that, and in fact, all of these tests assume things that are not true of fractal distributions, and we don't know how to do this for fractal distribution. We don't know how to do the statistics. Which is interesting. People think statistics is all done and everything, and it's not all done. And it will be interesting over the years to see how people uh, develop more information about this. And as I mentioned before, there's this word non-stationary, which means that the moments do not exist or that they vary in time uh, measured at different times so they do not reach finite limiting values. But it does not mean that the mechanism that produced this data is necessarily changing the time. And very often if we have big variance in the data, maybe we should check its limiting value. That is, maybe we should check how the variance changes um, as we accumulate more data because maybe the variance is really infinite. And as I said, this was the point that um, uh, uh, Max Delbruck missed in his analysis of Salvador Luria's data on the mutations. Um, and so when we see a large variance, and we see this, for example, not only in the mutation data, but we see it, for example, in the timing of the division of those cells in the tumor, uh, and also in cancerous cells that are not in tumors, such as in, uh, in uh, lymphomas and uh, cancerous cells in the blood that circulate. Uh, and so maybe we should check that maybe that timing is really infinite. And so this gives us something else to look for to tell whether it's fractal. And the basic point, if we plot the log of a moment against the log of the resolution to make that moment, what we're used to do, doing is hoping we can characterize this by a single value, that we have one measurement, and that gives us the mean, which is the true value of something. And what we're seeing here is that what we really need to determine is how the measurements depend on the resolution. And what we're really getting out of this is the slope of this line, which is related to the fractal dimension, which tells us as we go to smaller scales what new pieces we see.
Um, so in summary of the uh, talk about fractals, uh, fractals are self-similar. That is, they have small pieces that resemble a whole. For mathematical fractals resemble exactly, or our fractals resemble in a statistical sense in biology. We have scaling that because as we go to different scales, we measure different things, the value measured for a moment or a statistical property will depend on the resolution at which it's measured. And we have the property of dimension, which quantifies how many new pieces appear as the resolution is changed. And we have these statistical properties of fractals that I've described today, which is that the moments may not exist or they may tend to zero or infinity. Do I need to run back through that set of four things or we're okay? We're okay. And to give you places where you can learn more about fractals, uh, the classic reference is Mandelbrot's book called The Fractal Geometry of Nature, which uh, is always written in everyone else's references 1982, but mine seems to have been published in 1983, at least the edition that I have. So I don't know whether it's 82 or 83. Did anyone here go to hear Mandelbrot last week? So I guess the answer to that is no. Uh, and um, books that describe the real mathematics of fractal, which means measure theory and topology, are a really nice book by, uh, Ed, oops, uh, by Edgar called Measure uh, Topology and Fractal Geometry by Springer. So it's yellow. And uh, all the mathematical books by Springer are yellow, except for Hans Otto's book, which are not black and silver and other colors. But uh, the typical mathematics books by Springer are yellow. And see, it's taken me like 40 years of education to say Springer instead of Springer. Why don't you stick on the TV, actually? Thanks. Um, uh, but, uh, but I can do that now. I can say Koch and uh, Wagner and, you know. Um. So, um, This is an excellent book. At the beginning of this book, he says that this book is entirely really a monograph on fractal dimension, and it is. This whole book is just to describe what, what fractal dimension means. And it's an excellent book and starts in the beginning, but proceeds in a very rapid way that mathematicians are comfortable with. It's another really nice book by Bonsley called Fractals Everywhere, which is now in a second edition, which just makes me feel old, so I've just listed the first edition here. Because um, I don't get second editions, usually. Um, and uh, Bonsley's book is more little, it has all the mathematics in it, but has more explanations than a typical mathematics book would have. Uh, and nice pictures from National Geographic. And um, which he's used fractals to represent in an information compression scheme. Another excellent book more oriented toward physics is Jan Fetter's book called Fractals. Uh, everybody has a picture of their native coastline. He's from Norway. He has a picture of the coastline of Norway instead of England in his book. Um, and uh, David Avnir, who wrote a really stupid thing in science recently, um, who uh, has a really nice book called The Fractal Approaches to Heterogeneous Chemistry, which is an expensive book. It's over 100 bucks, but has a lot of nice articles about chemistry and geology um, in terms of fractals. And the last two listed here, maybe only one of which is listed. Oops. Uh, well, that's okay. Uh, that, was, uh, that was my book, uh, which is uh, Fractal Physiology. So we don't need a, um, I don't think we need to do that. Um, because you know who I am, presumably. Um, so that book is called Fractal Physiology by Bassingweight, Leibovitch, and West. Uh, do we have any questions on fractals? Uh, you'll get the opportunity next spring to take my fractal course if you want to hear everything you just heard again, uh, but also in greater detail and more of the mathematics and more of the applications. And in that course, I describe more of the biology. So we kind of see more of what fractals is actually telling us to learn or helping us to learn out of the system. So there's more discussion of biology. Um, and we have tapes from the previous time I taught that course. So either I'll teach it live 
or we'll listen to the tapes and I'll be one of those three things in the shadows like in uh, Miss Science Mystery Theater 3000, is that the name <laughs> of it? And I, and I want to be the one with the, the bubblegum machine head actually is the, is the, so I still don't know how we're going to do that. And we have a little treat for you here. So uh, basically everyone who's registered for the course gets to fill out a um, student assessment form for the course. You have two so more weeks of class. class. No, it's not the end. This isn't the end. I mean, it's, don't, I feel like I should go up in a puff of smoke or something. But uh, it's, no, we have two I more weeks. I didn't realize we were that close. We were, we're that close. Ah. Right. As you get older, time moves faster. Get up, get up. So um, I have instructions to read. And then could someone volunteer to take these over to? She, she's volunteered? No. <laughs> don't volunteer her because they have to go back to Rona, I think. So OK, thank you. Um, and, and tell Rona as your reward, Rona has to tell you who Cotman's father is. <laughs> so uh, let me read you the instructions. Um, you could go if you want, yeah. yeah. All people who are not enrolled in the course can go. Um, so you can go too, right. And you, well, you can go or stay depending on what you want to do. Uh, but you can't fill out a form. Uh, so it's only three of you, uh, which is bad. There should be um, who, how, how many more? Alejandro. Alejandro hasn't come for some time. Uh, besides Zimbal, who else are we missing? No. Bill Cur Cur Curlis hasn't come for a while. All right, let's let's do this three and uh, maybe. So let me, let me read the instructions. Your instructor will provide you with a packet of assessment forms that are to be filled out in class. Hand out one assessment form to each student. Oh, announce that a number two pencil must be used to complete the form. Do we, normally I bring number two pencils. Do we have? Uh, do you have any pencils? No. Um, well, it should, it'll probably work without that. I'm turning it in. I